Welcome back. Are we ready to say, no, we can't say good evening yet, can we? We're just going to have to do it again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, buenas tardes. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, that, that last panel, I just have to say thank you again. It was really, really incredible. And um, set up this next part of the event really, really well. Um, so I'm just going to say a tiny word about the, what this next session is and introduce Monica briefly. And then she's going to um, introduce Elizabeth Yampier and get the discussion going. Um, before I do that, though, I do want to um, add to the thanks from earlier also to all of the scholars and interns at the Rappaport Center um, who have been have played many roles hidden and unhidden. Um, and so I just, would you all wave so people can see you? So, um, yeah. <laughs> Including the design of the program and things like that, they've been very involved in, so, um, and we really appreciate it. Um, so uh, the title of this session is Disaster Capitalism, Colonialism, and Climate. Um, and it is a conversation with Elizabeth Yampierre, um, who is in Texas with us because uh, yesterday at the Rothko Chapel in Houston, she delivered the fourth annual Francis Tarleton Sissy Farenthold Lecture in Peace, Social Justice, and Human Rights. Um, and that is a, I, wanted, I did it without notes, and that is a lecture um, that the Rappaport Center um, collaborates with the Rothko Chapel on we do it two, every other year there and every other year here. Um, but this year we decided we couldn't wait. I mean, we just couldn't miss the opportunity um, to have the person who was lecturing there also come here. And that's because it was, is Elizabeth Yampierre. Um, and just so you know what we, um, that, that lecture, uh, we choose speakers who we say will inspire their audiences to think and act creatively to respond to some of the greatest challenges of the 21st century. Um, and I think that began to happen last night and um, will continue today. So I'm looking forward to that. And because of last night, Monica has even better questions to ask. <laughs> uh, so, or, or the next level. So we're going to continue one conversation, but also the conver I think it ties in incredibly well with what we just heard. Um, so this is a little strange to introduce someone you've already met to you. So um, Monica Jimenez already told you a bit, um, those of you who are here, a bit about herself and, um, and very much tying it uh, to this symposium. Um, so I'll just repeat that she is an assistant professor in African and African diaspora studies here at UT. Um, she's also on the steering committee of the Rappaport Center. Um, also on the Bridging Disciplines panel in Human Rights. Um, and she organizes incredible conferences um, and knows great people to bring and get into conversation with each other. Um, and uh, so, um, and what's incredible is Monica's only been here, this is her second year, um, and so has really jumped in. Um, as she said, she did start her, I guess, postgraduate career here at the law school, um, her graduate work here at UT Law School. Um, and then she also has a master's in Latin American studies from UT. And she went away and practiced law, but we lured her back. And the history department really lured her back. Um, and so she also has a PhD in history. And I think that makes you a legal historian, which is something to add to your bio the next time around. Um, <laughs> And uh, so the bio does have more information on her. Um, she has a book manuscript entitled American State of Exception, Race and Law in the Making of Puerto Rico. Um, and that really is, um, I've watched it develop over time. And last I saw it, it was very much a legal history book um, and focusing on 19th century um, American constitutional law and not just the insular cases which she talked about, but putting them into conversation with um, Dred Scott and the Marshall Trilogy, um, and re really looking at the role that race has played in the construction of Puerto Rico and other 
um, U.S. colonial interventions. Um, so I think with that, I'll turn it over to you to introduce Elizabeth and keep the conversation going. Thank you, Karen. The thing that Karen also didn't say was that uh, she was my professor when I was here. So I've, and I have a whole letter of recommendation I could read. <laughs> uh, so I've, I've, I've been knowing Karen for a very long time, and she has been a wonderful mentor and champion of, of me and my work. So thank you, Karen. Um, I want, very quickly before I introduce Elizabeth Jan Pierce, who I am so very excited to be sitting here next to and who I'm really excited just to chat. Oh, please, please. Although it means a lot coming from you, so thank you. Um, I do want to sort of highlight what is on the screen behind us, um, which is a slideshow that was put together um, by uh, Marina. Hello? There I am. Marina Reyes Franco, who is a curator. Um, in, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and um, we were put in touch with her, and Beth Colon, who is here, who is a grad student in ADS, um, helped me to, to reach out to her and put this together and, and ask her to put it together. And what it is is um, there is an explanatory slide. I don't want to take too much time, but I do want to sort of highlight this work that is a work of the, um, it's coming out of the community of, of Comerio, Comerio. Um, and it is uh, the work of Defend Puerto Rico, uh, Cocodoro, and La Maraña, um, which are three community organizations that have come together to address the needs of this particular community, Comerio, um, through not only reconstruction and autogestión, but through art as well. So um, the project of photographing uh, this recovery is also part of a uh, workshop in photography that this group brought to the community. And so we are gonna run the slides. Um, I think they really actually speak to the work that Elizabeth does, uh, which I'll introduce her in a moment and she'll talk more about, but I think this is very relevant to the conversation that I hope we will have. So I'm gonna let it run, if that's okay with everybody. Um, okay, so it is my great, great, great pleasure uh, to uh, introduce Elizabeth Jan Pierre, who is an internationally recognized Puerto Rican attorney and environmental and climate justice leader and a badass in her own right. She is currently executive director of UPROSE, Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. Based in Sunset Park, UPROSE is an intergenerational, multiracial, nationally recognized women of color-led grassroots organization. And this, this is their language, so this is not my language. This is how they describe themselves, which is amazing. Um, that promotes sustainability and resiliency through community organizing, education, leadership, development, and cultural artistic expression. Yampir is also the co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance, a coalition of 58 urban and rural frontline communities, communities, organizations, and supporting networks in the climate justice movement. The Climate Justice Alliance adapt, adopts a, and then again, this is their language, translocal organizing strategy in order to build a just transition away from extractive systems of production, consumption, and political oppression, and towards resilient, regenerative, and equitable economies. I cannot wait to hear more about this. Uh, prior to assuming the executive director position at UPROSE, she was the director of legal education and training at the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, which is now uh, known as Latino Justice, director of legal services for the American Indian Law Alliance, and dean of Puerto Rican student affairs at Yale University. I really do want to hear about this later. Not, not as part as this, but I was at Yale, and I'm wondering if we cross paths there. I really am. Um, Jan Pierre was the first Latina chair of the Environmental Protection Agency's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council and also served as a member of the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences Advisory Council. In 2010, Elizabeth was the opening speaker at, Obama's administration, Obama, at the Obama administration's first White House Forum on Environmental Justice. In 2015, she was part of the leadership of the People's Climate March, which included over 400,000 people. Her work has been featured in books and media outlets throughout the United States, Latin America, and Europe, and she has been particularly visible in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, advocating for a just recovery for the island that would center Puerto Ricans and their local knowledge rather than reinscribing colonial logics of disaster capitalism. Jan Pierre, as, uh, as Karen mentioned, is also the fourth annual speaker in the Francis Tarleton Sissy Farron Told in Doubt lecture series, um, which I won't go too much into because Karen explained what it was quite beautifully. But I will say that her, uh, her talk yesterday was greeted with great enthusiasm 
um, and really provoked some amazing conversations. So I think we will have that experience here as well. So please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Young here. Can you hear? Because I feel like it's cutting in and out. No? no? Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I was going right to. I was going to project. Um, it, it really is an honor um, and a blessing to be in this space with you all today. Um, I um, I was just, you know, I felt her energy when I met her over the phone, and um, and then uh, listening to that introduction, um, it, I was reminded of the brilliance uh, of of our people. Um, and how, uh, as people of African and indigenous ancestry, um, we uh, sometimes think of ourselves um, as less than, because colonialism has made us do that. Um, and we have a trajectory that comes from struggle um, and in, into space, and that we need to be able to feel our power. Uh, because while Karen was talking about her, I was like, this is one powerful sister that I'm sitting next to. Um, and if you are in her classroom, you're really fortunate to be um, in a space with someone who has been blessed by the ancestors. So I, I'm really happy to be here with you today. You. I feel really <laughs> honored. Um, and I hope that I can share with you something that will transform you, that will uh, move your hearts and your minds into action. Uh, because we are living in the age of climate change and the people least responsible for creating it are the ones that are going to be most impacted. Uh, this is something that climate change grew out of extraction, out of the extraction of our land, of our labor, of our people, out of colonialism, and out of slavery. And now, now that we're about to become the majority in this country, uh, it will be fully taken hold by the time we get to that. And so now we need to really pivot to figure out how we reclaim our traditions, who we were before we became colonized, who we were before we became addicted to consumption um, and, and, and just being part of a, a throwaway culture, um, the things that generally make us feel good as people who come from struggle, uh, because those are the things that are going to save us. And, and Puerto Rico was really the canary in the coal mine. Uh, Puerto Rico was an example of what happens to a nation that has endured a history of austerity, neglect, and extraction, and how climate change landed on top of that history. So I am really honored to be here and, uh, and honored to join you in conversation. Um, so gracias, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you to tell us just a little bit about your trajectory, how you came to this work, how you came to Uprose. Um, for those of us who might not be quite as familiar with, with, with your work, um, can you tell us a bit about just how you came to climate sure. change and uh, so, climate justice? So um, I, I was um, a civil rights litigator, and, um, and Uprose uh, was founded in 1966. I did not found Uprose. Um, <laughs> Every once in a while, I'm like, yo, the Botox is good, but it's not that good. Um, but I came to Uprose in 1996 because um, it had lost, it was a time when Giuliani had basically taken out a lot of the organizations that were founded in the 1960s. And Uprose was one of those. It was the oldest Puerto Rican community-based organization in Brooklyn. It had been founded uh, by Puerto Ricans who were trying to create organizations to address uh, the educational uh, attainment levels of the community, social services, and it had lost almost all of its funding and it was going to disappear. It was a tiny storefront uh, on 54th Street and 4th Avenue in Sunset Park, if you know Brooklyn. And, um, and so I really sort of came in, it was a temporary thing, uh, to try to resolve the 990s, going back to the 1970s, to really fix the infrastructure of the organization. And uh, during that time, like the whole staff left, it was like a sinking ship and, um, and it was a mess. And I remember um, my mom saying to me, oh my God, why do you wanna do this? You're a lawyer, you can make a lot of money. And I said, mom, you know what? This is just full of possibility and we can kick ass here. So she started uh, answering the phones and uh, a girl from a few blocks away came in and she said, what do you, what do, you do here? And, and I told her jokingly and corny, 
Um, I'm the facilitator of your dreams. What do you want to do? She's like, I want to know what you do. And I said, well, you know what? You fill up the place with young people and we will talk about that. And she did. And so, uh, so we started really by trying, uh, by finding out what were priorities for them. Uh, and then I spent a year trying to figure out what other organizations were doing in Sunset Park and how we could add value and not compete. Uh, that we really wanted to work in a way that was collaborative and move away from that extract, extractive, nonprofit, industrial complex model of competing with other institutions. And what we learned in that process from really listening to the community was that they were about to expand the Gowanus Expressway, which had 250,000 uh, cars going through there every day and 25,000 trucks, that the majority of the asthma discharges lived along the Gowanus Expressway, uh, that people lived along a lead belt. Uh, and so the young people really wanted to be involved in that. And that was my introduction to environmental justice. And so I had never taken a class uh, in environmental policy. I wasn't an environmentalist. I thought that, you know, they were tree huggers and, and that they really had nothing to do with our communities. Uh, but I learned that trees were the lungs of our community and that we had to plant them because um, they really created a barrier between the emissions that were coming out of the trucks and the lungs of our children. And, um, and so the young people became like this organizing core of the organization, and the organization quickly became an intergenerational organization with young people on staff, young people on our board of directors, young people integrated into leadership. We don't have a youth program. Um, we don't ask the young people, what do you think? We disagree with them, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not, like we are sometimes right and sometimes we're not. And so we learn across the table from each other and I think that uh, our organization is, um, is stronger and our organizing is stronger because we're intergenerational. On our board of directors, we have um, Joaquin Brito who started at Uprose when he was 14 and is now getting two masters from Cornell. Uh, we have, uh, Ting Ting is a climate justice organizer, she's right there in the audience. Ting Ting started at Uprose when she was 12. Uh, so we are really, you don't age out when an organization is intergenerational. Um, and we went from looking at lead paint, um, transportation, to then fighting the siting of a power plant. And so we stopped the siting of a 520 megawatt power plant that would have been the size of three football fields, uh, literally like right across the street from where people live. We, op we doubled the amount of open space in the community. Uh, the community uh, has about 130,000 people. One third of the community is under the age of 19. Um, high levels of obesity, diabetes, um, and a quarter of open, open space for every 1,000 people living there. So there was no open space. So we doubled that. Uh, we expanded a median, brought back a bus, sent four young people to Antarctica on scientific expeditions two to the North Pole, and we hold the largest gathering of young people of color on climate change um, in the country. And the reason we do that is because young people of color are not at the table. Basically, you have a lot of white-driven climate change initiatives that bring young people of color in to be the poster children to their agendas, uh, or they literally um, need them so that they satisfy that emotional or whatever spiritual quota. Uh, but they don't really have any power. And so we felt that as adults that we were basically going to be the first line of defense of saying no, hell no, that's not going to happen. There's not going to be yet one more generation that has to go through what we've gone through. And so we created the Climate Justice Youth Summit to address uh, organizations like PowerShip, for example, uh, that had the opportunity to be meaningful, meaningfully inclusive and have young people of color actually um, being part of those tables. So we literally grew in a, an organic way based on what the community was telling us was a priority. We never had an agenda. Uh, we learned planning. We learned, uh, we basically became experts in brown fuel remediation, energy, uh, air quality. Uh, our young people have equipment where they measure levels of NOx, SOx, and carbon monoxide. Uh, and PM 2.5, um, and as we learned, we taught. So while we were learning the language, um, we, we, we were all learning it together. And so that's kind of how, how that happened, but it started out with a tiny little storefront 
uh, where my mom was crying um, with no funding and I didn't get paid like for about three years. I had very few resources uh, and I come from struggle so it's not like, you know, I was one of those kids who had like money, like a trustee fund, you know, on the side, a trust fund or whatever you call those things. So, um, <laughs> So it was, it, it was hard, but I will say that uh, I gave up the practice of law, and I'm not encouraging you to do that. You can always use your legal education, but it has been the most satisfying, the most productive thing that I have ever done in my life, and we have literally transformed lives and changed the landscape, passed legislation, uh, and so we, we believe that there isn't anything that we, can do, we can't do. So. Uh, it, it's, it was just an unexpected introduction that just changed my life. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry I went on so long. You gotta stop. No, you gotta no, do double I love dutch. it. That's, that's beautiful. Um, and I know that we all wanted to know about Up Rose and you, so that's beautiful. Um, I wanna ask you this before we get too far into the conversation, because you said on, in our phone call a couple of weeks ago that we have to define climate justice for ourselves, otherwise it will be defined for us. Mm -hmm. And so I really want you to, to, to define climate justice for us and then talk about what that is, what that tension is between our definition and those that would be imposed. So um, there is a climate movement and there's a climate justice movement and the climate justice movement comes out of the environmental justice movement. Basically, frontline communities, communities of color, where um, environmental burdens have been cited, where the perception was that we were powerless and we couldn't fight back. So we're talking about communities like, you know, Richmond and Detroit and the Gulf South, uh, and 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 you know, places like uh, the South Bronx and Sunset Park, uh, places where you've got uh, a lot of people of color that have the waste transfer stations, the power plants, all of the polluting infrastructure that serves more privileged communities cited in our neighborhoods. Um, and so one of the tenets of environmental justice is that we speak for ourselves. And so the climate justice movement comes out of that, this idea that we speak for ourselves, that we don't become passive recipients of somebody else's good intentions, and that we lead because these are issues that affect our communities directly. And so um, the language gets co-opted and the principles like just transitions get co-opted, kind of like hip hop got co-opted um, and, 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 and our culture gets co-opted and sold back to us, right? Um, and it's really important that we make those distinctions because what we say is that white folks that want to be part of the climate justice movement or want to work with us have to make a commitment to building just relationships to engaging in self-transformation, to being able to check their privilege, to work in a way that builds community power and builds the bigger we, but doesn't supplant local leadership. So people who wanna speak for us really engage in what I think is contemporary missionary behavior, uh, where, and, and is racist, you know, they, maybe they dream their entire life that they wanna go and work with people in the South Bronx. And then they get there and they find out that people in the South Bronx are doing the, the work, that they're basically putting in infrastructure, that they're putting in trees, that they're building green buildings, that they're doing all of that work, uh, that they have solar gardens. Um, and so they have to ask themselves, oh, what is my role now? I, this was my dream to help this community. You know, there are people who call my organization because they want an immersion, they want to be immersed in the Latino community so they could learn how to speak Spanish. When the hurricane hit Puerto Rico, I had graduate students who were calling because they wanted to go to Puerto Rico so that they could do their thesis on the disaster in Puerto Rico. And I was horrified. Uh, and I think of that as a kind of disaster capitalism. And so when I, when I think about climate justice and that economic frame, which is what we call just transition, moving away from fossil fuel dependency to a non-extractive economy that creates local livable communities, those concepts come out of Indian country from Sandy Rock. They come out of Black Mesa. They come out of black people's communities in Detroit and down in the South, you know, people. And, and, and so what you see are folks that basically take the language without having created it, appropriate it, and then make it something that's different, that's not quite what we intended. And so, um, so it seems sometimes, I think, that we don't wanna share or work with other people, <laughs> and that's not true. We're a really diverse movement. We look like everybody. And I'm Puerto Rican. We look like everybody. 
Um, literally, like we're the original rainbow people, right? So, um, <laughs> so I'm always accusing nice looking people of being Puerto Rican. Do you do that too? <laughs> I did that and I'm last like, don't week. get offended. <laughs> I'm like, don't get offended because you know we're cute. So, um, <laughs> so, um, so I think, so I think language matters, right? I think language matters, um, and how you define yourself matters. Um, I, I remember when I was a young lawyer. Um, and I was trying to explain uh, to, um, to high school students the difference, how language worked. Mm -hmm. And I would say to them, I could say that I am a minority that wants to help my community, or I can say that I'm a Puerto Rican of African and indigenous ancestry who wants to dismantle the systems that have kept us oppressed. And, what do you, and what's the difference? And they'd be like, because <laughs> language is powerful and it matters. And these definitions flow and they change over time as we learn more things but they really matter because they really honor a construct, a frame that comes from the front line. So there is a difference between the climate movement and the climate justice movement. The climate justice movement is front line led, the people that are most impacted. The climate movement is led by environmental defense, NRDC, Sierra Club, uh, US CAN. Um, it's very different, but often, in a lot of different situations, we work together because we absolutely have to. And so we're trying to figure out how we build alignment uh, because climate change is demanding that alignment be built. Um, I think it actually that brings me to the next question that I plan to ask, but I actually think it's, it's even more urgent. Um, and it's that it, I know that as you, in the language of Uprose's description, right, so intergenerational, multiracial, uh, women of color led, and in your own discussions, um, the intersection between racial justice and climate justice are inseparable for you, but they're not a common sense for everyone else. So how do you engage in, in putting those things together and making it um, as urgent as you no understand it to be and as necessary as you understand it to be when there is a resistance to trying those sorts of struggles together? Well, the environmental justice movement was always about where we live, where we pray, where we play. It was always about everything. It wasn't just about the environment. Um, and, you know, when you think about environmental justice, a lot of times people think that it's something that started like 20, 25 years ago. Uh, but it really started in the slave quarters. It really started when people were given the worst food, were exposed to the worst conditions, uh, and, then, and then grows, really grows from there, right? So it's that poor health, uh, incarceration, all of those things are part of your environment, your school environment, all of that is environment. Um, and so one of the things that we often say is like we can't choose between, you know, going to a protest against police brutality and going to a protest on climate change that we live at the intersection of all of those things. And when we talk to people in the community who don't make the connections, imagine that you are, that you've got two or three children and you're working and you're coming home and you have to take care of the kids and you've got, you know, debts and you've got the kinds of problems that come from coming from struggle uh, and all of a sudden you're being asked to come to a meeting about climate justice. Well, what does it have to do with you? Um, so we ask people, do you have asthma? Do you have upper respiratory disease? How do, um, are you eating food that has, you know, GMOs? Are there health disparities in your family? We make the connection between the choices that people are making and how they're living um, and climate. And we, you know, we said to this woman once, we said, so you basically crossed the border with a gallon of water and, and because you wanted all of the amenities that this country has to offer, and now you have to deal with making sure that you reduce energy, that you recycle, that you repurpose. You have to live differently because the folks that made you have to walk over that border with that gallon of water have put us in the, in the situation right now where we're gonna have to make some radical decisions that are personal and collective. And so you basically just bring it home, everything from war. Uh, if you're talking to people in the Middle East, you know, I was talking to a cab driver the other day who's Bangladeshi, and I said, well, we were talking about climate change. You're talking about somebody from Palestine, and you're saying, well, you know, every time that Palestine gets bombed, basically a brown field is being created, and you're growing food <coughs> in a brown field, which means that then you're going to have health disparities. So really understanding your base, understanding their history and honoring it and respecting it and making connections between that and this huge crisis that we have to deal with today. Because that respect really brings out information that is gonna help in building social cohesion. 
So once you start talking to people, you find out that there are practices and traditions that they have that are going to help us survive the changes that are coming. So it's, it's, it's a very, um, it's, it, you just really have to pay attention, honor, respect, and listen, and then reflect back. I, I, hope, I hope I answered that right. I bet you understood what I meant. I think it's, so. You, we're organized. There's, there's, there's no right answer. There's just the, what, the answer you want to give us, the, the way you want to think about it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump forward and ask you the question that I've been posing to all of our symposium participants, okay. which we spoke about a little bit on the phone, which is how has this last year impacted you, your work, your community in, in, in Brooklyn, but also I know that you've traveled to the island and have been in dialogue and in conversation with the community organizers there. So I just kind of want to hear about what for you, it can be the personal sort of, right, the personal this last year and also the professional this last year, because I think it's, it's a lot, right? It's a lot. <laughs> It was, um, you know, your, um, I, I had just become co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance. We have about 68 groups now. And um, I had been working nationally um, and we were paying attention to Houston. Um, and we were working with an organization there called Tejas. And the folks in Tejas were coming up with this concept called uh, Just Recovery. Um, and. Um, and so there I was, uh, co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance, um, Puerto Rican, um, at Puerto Rican diaspora, um, a child of extraction, you know, from Operation Bootstrap. Just, you know, my, my, my grandparents were really pretty much forced out of Puerto Rico, who they were living in dire poverty um, and had lost, like my grandmother had lost half her children to hunger and disease in a place called El Fanguito um, in San Dulce. And, um, and so um, we, those of us who are um, part of the diaspora, have always played a role uh, in, in supporting and defending Puerto Rico. We did it with Vieques. I know that my husband was arrested for Vieques, that I marched, that my son um, also, when he was little, he came out in El Diario uh, with like a little bandana. And she's like, you know, this is what we do. It's, it's our act of defiance when you're born and raised in the United States and you treat it like a second class citizen, you hold on to that Puerto Ricanness as a way of surviving um, the assaults on your, on, on your being. And so you're feeling all of that and you, you know, that's who we are. And then all of a sudden I'm standing in front of the TV and, 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 and the, tears, the tears are just unstoppable and I'm shaking. And my mom calls me and my mom says, my mom is, I have never, my mom is a badass. I have never seen the woman cry. And my mom said, you have to do absolutely everything that you can for Puerto Rico. Absolutely. And she was hysterical. I, I'd be in meetings and she would call me and she was watching the stuff on TV. She, she lives in Miami. So that's, that's how I felt it personally. And so, um, so the, the storm happened September 20th and on October 11th, we launched a national campaign called um, Our Power PR. And um, it was, uh, we had actions in five cities. We sent five brigades to Puerto Rico. We came up with the language of just recovery that we had basically borrowed from Houston, from the folks in Houston, a people to people just recovery. And we, we met with our members. We have members in Puerto Rico. And we basically asked them, what do you need? What do you need from us? Uh, and what do you need for us to do? And so what we were asked was, one, to keep Puerto Rico in the press, uh, to basically uh, raise money and set, send it to the front line, to the people most impacted, um, and also to get collect materials that would make it possible for people to farm mm -hmm. and for people to recover. And so uh, while everybody was sending water bottles, we were sending water filtration uh, devices and we were sending rakes and we were sending uh, solar and all of that that we were able to raise money through uh, from uh, CJA. CJA is the Climate Justice Alliance. It was the Climate Justice Alliance, uh, Grassroots International, Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, and Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace, if you read the news, we. Uh, had a meeting with Annie Leonard and I basically asked her for the ship. I wanted the ship to go into Puerto Rico and I wanted the ship to violate the Jones Act. Um, and, um, and I wanted 
I wanted international attention and I wanted them to violate the Jones Act because um, we felt that something like that, ha and we were in, you know, we got into little arguments. Like I would say, but you do it for the whales and you do it for the dolphins and you're not gonna do it for my people. I want the ship. I wanted to go all Batman on them with like a big signal dropping. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted a, a banner drop from the Brooklyn Bridge. I, I wanted people repelling off up the side of the buildings. I wanted everything that Greenpeace does. So um, I got the ship. They didn't violate the Jones Act. Um, but on the ship, we did an art build, and we had, um, we had uh, signs that you could see aerially that said, kill the Jones Act. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had um, tons of actions against Promesa. We've, we, out of Our Power PR comes Our Power PR NYC, which is uh, a coalition of five boroughs in New York City that includes upstate, folks from Connecticut. P folks just wanted to be part of it. And, um, and they have really sustained engagement um, to keep Puerto Rico on the press so that it doesn't disappear. And that's really important. If you guys think about it for a second, about five years ago, um, there was a huge um, hurricane in the Philippines. And 10,000 Filipinos perished. And no one talks about that anymore. Um, and there was, a there was a devastating earthquake in, in IT, and nobody talks about that anymore. That when something at that, and, 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 and the disaster doesn't really even happen that day, it happens months later, years later. In Puerto Rico, basically, you know, we saw a Cat 5 hurricane hit an island with 23 super funds. And when I think about that, I think that they don't know and will not know for a long time how many people die in Puerto Rico as a result of Hurricane Maria. Mm -hmm. But when you think about 23 super funds, I think, I envision um, toxics and toxicants landing in people's lungs, landing in people's gardens, on their rooftops, on the walls, brownfields, sick buildings being created all over the entire island. And so we won't know for years how many people have died. So from the diaspora's perspective, our goal <coughs> is to make sure that those stories don't disappear, that we put a spotlight on it, that we're talking to Gris, that we're talking to all of the big you know, bloggers uh, and that we keep it in the press, that we're constantly tweeting. Uh, people have moved on. Uh, they start talking about new things and we're like, yeah, and Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico. And I know we're really annoying, um, but nowhere do 5,000 people disappear and it doesn't become a huge crisis, except for Puerto Ricans because of the racism with which Puerto Rico was treated when this happened. This country would just, you know, the response from this government was racist. And one of the things that I said to the New York Times was that if 5,000 kittens had died, people would be up in arms. They would be, PETA would be marching. People would be so upset that 5,000 kittens died. But 5,000 Puerto Ricans died or more. You know, that's a number that I'm just throwing out there because I believe it's more than that. Um, so, uh, so, our, so the coalition was really created <coughs> to sustain engagement and to not just do immediate relief, but to provide people with what they needed so that they could sustain relief. So like you mentioned La Maraña, and we met with La Maraña. La Maraña had read an article that I had written with Naomi, and it was about imagining a Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. a Puerto Rico that belongs to Puerto Ricans that's rebuilt by Puerto Ricans. And they developed an entire proposal out of that. And so what we did was we introduced them to funders, and we navigated relationships between the front line and different funders. We met with about 90 funders that we introduced to the front line. And then all the other initiatives that came after really pretty much copied our language. Uh, they went on the website, they copied our frame, and that's okay, you know, as long as they were moving the money to the front line. Um, so that, those are some of the things that we did. Just recently, September 20th, we had a big action in New York City um, where um, we basically lit up the Citibank and we put disaster capitalism, um, you, know, you know, sovereignty for Puerto Rico, all of the things that people in Puerto Rico were asking us for. We had, uh, it was me, Rosa Clemente, Naomi Klein, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. It was a lineup of mostly women. Um, the climate justice movement is pretty much led by women and a lot of the reconstruction and the rebuilding that is happening on the island is also being led by women. And so um, 
So the place was pretty much packed and that was another opportunity to bring media attention, uh, not just to the disaster, but to the people to people just recovery that's happening on the ground in Puerto Rico. So, um, so that's, you know, that's what we did. We had all of those big national organizations um, pull their resources and move really quickly. And I went, I went in February, um, and I went while I was sick, so I'm, I'm, I, it was really hard for me because I, 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 I fell in January and, uh, and I had surgery in July and I was really in bad shape when I went. And what I saw, um, just um, this last thing I'll, I'll say, is that um, I went in with a really heavy heart, expecting just to see devastation. And what I saw was power. You know, uh, I, I saw um, people dancing and singing and building and painting and sharing food. Uh, and I saw a, a gathering of solutions that were local. Uh, I saw the birth of, of what I thought was revolution. We were able to fund a gathering of about 60 organizations uh, in Ajuntas. And, um, and I listened uh, the way that I listened when I first came to Uprose about what people were saying, because I didn't go there to talk to them about what they should be doing or how they should be thinking. Um, you know, if you talk to the women from La Baraña, they're, they're brilliant. They talk about participatory design and they have concepts that they've developed and that they've always been underfunded. One of the things that I did learn while I was there uh, was that um, a lot of the frontline organizations didn't have the capacity um, to access the funds that we were sending them, that they had never built that infrastructure. And so it was making it very difficult for us to get that resource, those resources to them. And so that taught us uh, that we needed to figure out how to do that because there were, there were going to be more extreme weather events. And so it has been a, a learning experience for us. Um, it has been an act of love. We also wanted very much for people who were not Puerto Rican to show up in solidarity and be part of the brigades. One of the things that we said is that there isn't a protest there isn't a protest for, for human rights where you don't see the Puerto Rican flag, whether it's for Muslim rights, whether it's for immigrant rights, whether it's for LGBTQ rights, whatever it is, when there is a violation of human rights, there is always a Puerto Rican flag. So we said we wanted to see the love that we give pe to people. We wanted to get that love back. Uh, because the other thing that happens with Puerto Ricans um, is that in the past 10, 15 years, um, they haven't been a central, no one is paying attention to Puerto Ricans. Like in New York City, uh, blacks and Puerto Ricans lag behind every single racial and ethnic group, including new immigrants. And so we literally have fallen between the cracks because the assumption is that we should be okay. And I remember um, uh, being on television where this, uh, this guy, this Latino, said to me, well, you guys are citizens, what is your problem? And so you know what? <laughs> Because you think that that's the only, that's the thing that solves everything. I said, so talk to, talk to indigenous people, how that's worked out for them. Talk to the Mexicans who have been here for 10 generations out in California, how that's worked out for them, how citizenship has worked out for them. Um, and it was this denigrating comment. Um, and I said to him, uh, you know what ta what's happened? I'm going to say this in Spanish. Um, que nosotros le abrimos la puerta a mucha gente en Nueva York y nos quedamos aguantando la puerta. Pero la vamos a soltar. Ahora la vamos a soltar. He was like, what? I said, I'm letting the door go. I said, we need to check back into ourselves and start taking care of ourselves. Because Puerto Ricans are so colonized, they are so colonized, we are so colonized, that um, we will stop taking care of ourselves to take care of somebody else. So another group will take care of themselves, and we will take care of them too. And when people criticize us, we're ready to criticize ourselves too. You know, like when we get criticized on issues of race, we're re ready to beat ourselves up when all of us are pathological because of racism, you know, uh, and it shows up in so many different ways across the Americas and across the African diaspora. But we're ready, we're ready to put ourselves down. And so we really need to understand that part of how we treat each other and how we deal with complex issues in Puerto Rico really come out of colonialism. So. No, I think that's, yes, and I've been, Everything that you've said, I've had so many thoughts about and not a, not quite sure how to formulate a question other than to say that there's such, and Marisol talked about this in the previous panel, but there's such natural alliances to be made and ways to 
uh, build communities that would just be beneficial for all of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so last night you were asked about um, migration, the connection between migration and climate change, um, and, and particularly um, uh, migrants that are coming from Central America. And I couldn't help but think about Puerto Rico's history of migration and the fact that as long, and you, you said this, as long as, as Puerto Ricans have been Puerto Ricans, they've been moving yes. um, here to the mainland U.S. for the most part, but other places as well. Um, I actually met some Puerto Ricans living in Greece when I was there for a year, and I was like, wow, how'd you get here, right? But people are everywhere. We are everywhere. <laughs> um, but so, so I just, I, I want to, I don't know, I want, uh, maybe you can sort of talk a little bit more about, about what, how we sort of understand the the ways that we are all the same, right? In 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 our in our suffering and our in our not suffering in our uh, experiencing climate justice yeah. and yet or injustice, uh, and yet there is a disconnect about how we talk about how to resolve it, um, even though it makes a very clear sense that we should be much more in community about it. One of the things that I think about when when I was little, my mom told me. Um, you may have been born with light skin and green eyes, but um, you may have a relative in North Carolina. And that was my mom's way of saying, you know, she was telling us that the, the, the slave ships that came through the mid-Atlantic trade um, ended up all over the Americas and that we were descendants of the African diaspora. I am the light, I, mean, I said that yesterday, my mother's most melanin challenged child. Um, and, um, but she, she wanted to know, she wanted me to know that, um, our nationality is a product of colonialization, right? That who we are, Puerto Ricans, Dominican, uh, Cuban, uh, Honduran, Costa Rican, that that is the creation of colonialism, right? Um, and that uh, when we understand that, that we know that we have power. But there are very specific things that are indigenous to us that, are, that make us different, um, and that those are things that are worth celebrating and being proud of. Um, when it comes to climate change, I remember that when I first started referring to the Puerto Ricans leaving the island as climate refugees, mm -hmm. that people on the island got really pissed on me, at me. They were like, no, this is austerity. This is colonialism. This is, um, this is um, neglect. This is what the United States has done to Puerto Rico. This is not climate. And I said, no, no, but it's climate too. Right. And climate change comes out of colonialism. It comes out of austerity. It comes out of extraction. Um, and if you're talking about climate justice, you're talking about all of those things. And it took a while before we were on the same page, and I didn't want to frame it for them because I thought that would be arrogant. Mm -hmm. And so when they said, don't call it that, we stopped. It was like when we had the rally in, um, in Union Square, and they said, don't call it a rally. Rallies, don't do anything. Call it... Um, a gathering, because gatherings are powerful, where people change, but rallies come with demands. We're like, okay, we'll call it a, a gathering. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we, you know, because we wanna, we're not, we're not going to be supplanting local leadership. Uh, we're here to support and enforce, uh, and to provide a platform and to use our resources stateside uh, to support Puerto Rico. So, um, but on the issue of climate, um, we then started talking about just transitions. How do you create community-owned solar? How do you move away from the grid? How do you make sure that communities have access to energy that they produce themselves? Mm -hmm. There is an organization uh, in Caguas that does that. How do you duplicate that in other parts of Puerto Rico? Is there somebody who's doing a mapping to find out where the assets and where the needs are in Puerto Rico and how we connect communities three to each other and provides put these systems in place. And there's this scary thing that it's not affordable, that it's not accessible, but it is. These things can be built to scale. And so bringing people in that have access to the technology and funders to be able to invest in those communities then got people talking about climate change. No, we gotta put in some solar panels on this farm. Um, even the farms, the fact that people are not allowed to produce things, the United States has a lockdown on farming that they've controlled what people can eat in Puerto Rico and what people can export in Puerto Rico. Um, that's also part of a just transition, moving away from an extractive economy to one where you create local livable economies. And the farmers in Puerto Rico are doing that. So, um, so, that, so we've, we've been 
you know, we've gone back and forth, and the folks that have gone over there are people who are coming from, like, black dirt farmers, folks that are down um, in, in San Antonio. All of our folks from all over the country have been going to Puerto Rico really sharing um, the things that they've been doing. And so the language has now changed. And if you look at, uh, like, Junta Gente, Junta Gente, which is um, a huge collective of community organizations and professors at the University of Puerto Rico, and you look at their platform, climate change is in there now. And there is work, you know, there's language about supporting a just transition. But it took a little bit of work because they were mad. It was like, yeah, don't be telling us this was climate change. This was colonialism. And I was like, yeah, it is. You're right. Right. Yeah, it took, it took a little bit of work. Right. But there is, I mean, there is something about trying to make those connections explicit. I had a, a student who is in my class this semester. I, I teach a class called Puerto Rico in Crisis, and some of my students are here. Uh, but one of my students told me that after Maria last semester in another class with a professor I don't know, um, she wanted to write a paper on, on Maria. And her professor was like, well, you can't talk about colonialism. It's, all, it's just about the, the hurricane and the disaster. Right? So, and that's a very, when you talk about Puerto Rico, obviously you cannot possibly write about Puerto Rico or think about Puerto Rico without thinking about colonialism. Um, but, but the ways that we sort of disaggregate these things that, for us, are no-brainers, they're connected, right? But people don't see it that way, and we have to kind of reconfigure the language. So you've said, you've referred to the, the mortalities, the deaths in Puerto Rico as genocide. Um, I have. I, I, yeah, and so I wanted to ask you about making, right, the decision to do that, because that is a very explicit decision with mm -hmm. political um, reasonings, and, and the ways that that's received, right? Both, both here and, and there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a moment, too, where we're sort of thinking about language really matters, right? And how you refer to a thing yeah. really matters. Well, when they sterilized one-third of the women in Puerto Rico um, in, rep in their reproductive ages, that was, that was genocide. That was something they did to black women in the South. Um, and, you know, literally like one-third of the women. Uh, when they talk about controlling the population and excess population, which is how they refer to Puerto Ricans, um, and that's, uh, I'm talking about like my grandparents' generation mm -hmm. uh, and how you controlled that, that was genocide. Um, not responding to the disaster in Puerto Rico and letting people die, that was genocide. That was intentional. That was a decision that was made about the value of life. It's, it's, it's similar to on another scale of how people, how, how um, this country deals with police brutality and how black males are killed. That, that's genocide. Um, so so um, there are consequences for using language that, like that. There are consequences for uh, naming, you know, racism. The consequences are loss of funding, um, all kinds of things that happen to my organization um, and happen to me in particular. Um, there are consequences. You get hate mail. Um, I know that um, we once had someone took the bolts off the gates of my organization because they know I'm the first one to get there so they could fall on me. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's consequences for using that language, but I think that the reason that there are consequences is because only a few people are willing to use the language. That if all of us named what it is, and if we had the, if our ovaries were big enough to basically call it what it is, that we, that we would basically be able to change the conversation. Uh, or even talking about Puerto Rico as a colony. Um, I, I could tell you my son, when my son was in middle school, my son did um, this independent study on Don Pedro Alviso Campo, mm -hmm. and he won a citywide prize, and the principal didn't want him to go to the state level because she said that that was an embarrassment to the school, mm -hmm. and, and called me in to talk about it. And um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and your response? I'm Are sorry. you not going to give us your response? Do you really want to hear it? I do. Um, <laughs> I think we all do. <laughs> I went in with my husband, and um, and, and I, I was talking about this to Ting the other day, and it was a small table, and I swear to God, I, it was she. I, I was sitting at the table, listening to her, and she looked at me. She goes, she said, "I am not a racist," and I said to her. You know, what you are is between you and God, but what you do to my son, that's between you and me. 
And my husband's like kicking me because I wanted to like beat the living daylights out of her because I thought of that as emotional terrorism, diminishing my son in that way. Um, and so he continued. He said to her, "If um, if I was, um, if you run this, if I run, the, if you run this school, and I come in and I tell you, I'm going to run it for you, and I'm going to tell you what's important and what's not, and you're going to give me." And, and I'm going to give you what you need, how would you feel about that? And she thought that that was offensive. And, and I know my son. I know that he is not that way. Um, but she tried to diminish him. She actually said that in front of the entire auditorium. This is an embarrassment to the school uh, because Rico thought that, um, you know, that um, he was talking about Don Pedro Aviso Campo and he was talking about independence and how, you know, and he was in sixth grade. So that, so the reason I'm sharing that with you is because y you were talking about how that conversation has changed I, in this setting. I just want to make sure everyone knows who Don Pedro Aguizu Campos is and why that might be an embarrassment, right? So the, the nationalist leader who, who violently, right, with violence, uh, pushed back against U.S. domination in Puerto Rico, right? So, so the fact that, that he chose to write about this particular person because he's our son, and when he was two years old, he had like Malcolm X buttons on his, you know, like, you know, like what are, you know, like how you keep the, you keep, you keep him on the left side of utero, and then you hope, when you know, when you're, when you're, when you're about to give birth, and then you hope that he doesn't end up in therapy or worse becomes a Republican. Um, so, so, so it was, it was. But the reason I share that with you is, I, you know, when I was in college, I remember taking a class called World History where the professor specifically said, we're going to skip Baroque art in Latin America. And so it's not, so it's not surprising <laughs> that, that somebody here, and you know, at this time that we're living in, that that kind of conventional dated thinking is still happening. And then what we do is we internalize it, and we start attaching a value mm -hmm. to, um, to what we're trying to study or what we think is important or an analysis that we think is necessary. Um, because you've got a lot of professors and a lot of folks that really are really conventional and really dated and don't understand that they're living in the age of climate change and that we need to start thinking about different economic frames, mm -hmm. different kind of governance, because climate change is demanding another kind of way of functioning and surviving. Uh, so I talk to my students a lot about common senses and how we build common senses that no longer sort of work, right? And so I think that's what you're describing, this, this common sense that would say this is how we function, this is how governance functions, and it's no longer mm -hmm. uh, useful or livable. Um, and we were just speaking in the, in the previous uh, panel about, go about government and the role of government. And the question was uh, about, you know, what do we do? Um, actually, it was Dr. Burroughs' question. How do we, in these moments in, in Puerto Rico specifically, where people are, like you said, um, creating other ways of living and, and islands of sovereignty, I think, is, is how Naomi Klein described it, right? But yet there is still government, right? And there's still this kind of, I always call it a superstructure, right, that sort of sits on top of you even as you're struggling against, um, you know, to try to create sovereignty for yourself. Um, so how do you, you know, wh how do you envision or, or can you envision or do you envision uh, a way wherein people can continue to create you know, local sovereignties or islands of sovereignty given a superstructure of colonialism? It's the only way that we're going to survive. Um, we, um, we, we just launched this community-owned solar cooperative and we've got four other uh, projects uh, on the way to basically make people the owner of their, of their utilities. I mean, we're really thinking about different kinds of economies. And I, I remember when I was in Puerto Rico, um, Naomi and I had a meeting with Mayor Yuling, and one of the things that I said to her is, you know, it's, it's amazing what people are doing. I think that you need to come up with a climate plan, and I think that you need to create um, an advisory group made up of all of these organizers, you know, um, if, if, if Colectiva Feminista, uh, all of these folks that are doing all of this work can be part of your advisory group and government, and you could see them as partners in decision making. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because she was trying to ask us, she was asking us, what do you think we should be doing? What are you doing in New York? Because in New York, 
you know, I serve on the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Board and the, and the Governor's um, Board on Just Transition, and we do all that. I'm always like, I really don't want to give you a response to that. I think that you need to talk to the folks on the island that are doing that, and governance is going to change, and you have an opportunity to change that. Um, I, I just think that um, the power of, um, of businesses, of corporations, of disaster capitalists uh, in Puerto Rico, um, and in other parts where they see tragedy as an economic opportunity, um, is so deep that it's really difficult difficult to really change what government governance looks like. And then there are those nonprofits, those institutions that come out with the rhetoric that reflects our values, but their process is extracted. So you see an organization like the Hispanic Federation and other organizations, and, I, and I'm sorry, but I name names, and other organizations that, you know, they, they talk about Puerto Rico se levanta, y lo que se están levantando son ellos, and they're using that rhetoric, and they're using the flag to basically give the impression that they really care about grassroots organizing, uh, and that they're invested in that. And then you look at their board of directors, and it's all the same corporations, um, that are basically taking advantage of the disaster in Puerto Rico. And you have to ask those questions. You have to see who funds them. You need to see who's making the decisions in those, in those uh, nonprofits and how those decisions get made. Uh, and then Puerto Ricans, because you've got people that are in the midst of disaster, they don't know who these organizations are. All they know is that they need stuff. So it is really difficult when, and, and seriously, like you saw in New Orleans, all of a sudden, all of the schools became pri uh, pri uh, privatized. Uh, they became charter schools. Um, infrastructure, what we saw in New Orleans was that after Katrina, that historical black communities that had gone through hell, that were there since slavery, all of a sudden got, uh, those communities were never brought back. Um, and all of a sudden, they got all of the amenities that privileged communities were going to benefit from. And we're seeing that happen in Puerto Rico as well, at a larger scale, I think, than it happened in New Orleans. And so the issue of governance becomes really complicated because governance is really controlled uh, by these corporations. Um, and even those, those elected officials that start, uh, you know, and in a good place, ends up, ends up compromised. So, um, so I think that people need to create their own local form of governance. They need to create those kinds of systems that are, gonna, that are going to work for them. And I, and I gotta say that I think that there needs to be some unity um, in the Caribbean and, uh, and that people need to start working with each other to create um, climate adaptation protocols to support each other in, in, in moments of extreme weather events um, and that they need to start organizing together, um, you know, it can't, literally, the Caribbean needs each other. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and they've been divided from the very beginning. You know, the, the English-speaking Caribbean doesn't speak to the Spanish-speaking Caribbean. They think they're separate. Mm -hmm. Somehow they think they're separate, even though Spanish is the language of another slaver, right? right. So, um, and that was intentional too, but I think that climate change presents people with an opportunity to change the relationships with each other, to redefine what governance is, and to create economic frameworks that are going to work moving forward. Um, so I have many more questions, but I do want to turn it uh, to our uh, our audience. But I, but on your last comment, I, I will say that 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 division among the Caribbean is historical, mm -hmm. and that uh, you know Don Pedro Alviso Campos, who was just invoked back in the 30s and 20s, was talking about pan Caribbean unity and the need for it then in response to imperialism. And so that we're still having the debate and the question now in an even more urgent time, I think, is, is uh, saying something. That's what they intended. They won. Well, <laughs> um, yes. So I want to. That was a good response. <laughs> <laughs> I want to open it up for questions because I know uh, uh, there are many questions and I don't want us to, uh, I don't want to monopolize, monopolize your time more or your, uh, your time more. So um, do you want to give one of these? Hi, uh, my name is Elvin Galarza. 
Um, I'm a little nervous, so if I choke up, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm an undergraduate engineering student here at UT in um, Dr. Jimenez's uh, course on Puerto Rico and crisis. Uh, I'm taking it because I wanted to learn more about my culture. My dad's Puerto Rican. He grew up in Brooklyn on 49th and 4th. Uh, oh, <laughs> yes, yeah, Sunset Park. Um, so you talked about women uh, being on the forefront of exposing and inciting change in positive and healthy reform. Um, I agree with this, first of all. Uh, this is evidence uh, from just the people talking in the room. Um, so basically, Dr. LeBron also talked about this earlier in the first session and gave an interesting perspective on what does it look like to do feminist organizing that isn't focused on the traditional issue. So basically, feminist issues of colon on colonialism, neoliberalism, neoliberalism, and capitalism. You talked about the youth in the beginning, and I just wanted to ask, um, basically, what is the, I guess, youth issue on this, knowing that there's a feminist issue as well? And I'm sorry. And and then also um, this understanding of what a leader is is uh, also one. Um, you know, you're trained and conditioned to be competitive, and not to share leadership, uh, to be ambitious and to move to the front. And so when we are talking about being leaderful, we're talking about very different things. And the idea of a leader is always the person who's 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 on the mic, and not the person who's doing the research on planning or engineering or citing, or doing environmental remediation. There's all kinds of ways of exercising leadership. The other thing is that leadership comes with accountability. You have to be accountable to a base, and you need to check in with a base. And that's, that's the other thing that happens where you've got people who are charismatic um, and like to talk on behalf of other people, but aren't accountable to anybody. We organize, and we're accountable. I was just, before I came here, on a national call talking about um, something that's popping up right now in the media that we have problems with, and we were checking in with each other and figuring out who was going to do the research so that we could figure out what our position was going to be. And that was a national call. I couldn't make a statement about that until we all checked in with each other. Um, on the issue of feminism, if you check out the website for Grassroots Global Justice Alliance, we are members of that. Um, that, is, um, that is the feminist response to climate change. Um, and it's really made up of women, women of color, and you know we think of uh, climate justice as a feminist issue. We know how it's going to affect m women uh, and how it's going to affect children. I always talk about Octa Octavia Butler's The Parable of the Sower because I think about, I always think about the future and I always think about what is going to happen to women and no book that I've read really captures um, what that future could look like. So it is a feminist issue, um, and, um, and it has to be intergenerational. And the reason it has to be intergenerational and not just youth-led is because I think the idea of youth-led is also a capitalist, extractive, competitive, ageist model uh, that pushes elders out. Uh, also, when people talk about intergenerational, people are either young or they're old. There's like nobody in the middle. Um, <laughs> And there are actually people who are 30 and 40 who think they're youth. I'm shocked by that. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really stunned by people who are like 30, 35, and they're like youth. I'm like, when did that happen? Um, and, and so, because we work with real youth, um, and, and, so, and so I, and the reason I say that is because being that age comes with a certain amount of gravitas and accountability. Um, and so uh, what we do is we infantilize youth and we expect big things from them. Uh, and we need to understand that every movement, every movement has been led by young people, whether it's the Young Lords or the Black Panthers or the Brown Berets or the Civil Rights Movement or the movement in South Africa for divestment, all of that was led by young people. Young people have power. And so 
you're, you know, so, and you have to feel that. But those of us who have been in rooms that young people have not been in, it's really important for us to have a conversation so that it doesn't take you 20 years to learn what we now know. Uh, and it's not wisdom in the sense that, you know, you all try to turn us into Yoda. No, no, it's not. Wisdom literally happens across the table. There are things that you know that I don't know and I need to know those things. There's a perspective that you have and a lens that is necessary for me to be a sharp and effective organizer. And then there's experiences that I've had that I have to share with you so that when you walk into that room where it's power, you know how to read that room. It took me years to know how to read that room. And so it has to be intergenerational and intergenerationally we're powerful. And intergenerational really is something that is grounded in our traditions as people of color, as people of African and indigenous ancestry. That's always who we've, we've been. It's only in the United States, this Anglo-American construct that pits generations against each other, where younger people are saying that older people are taking up too much space. Who says that about elders? When we think about our elders, we think about people who have survived and did things to make it possible for us to exist and to be here. They gave up everything. They went, through, um, they went through the kind of disrespect that we would never be able to tolerate. You know, my mom tells me that when she was little, they were the first Puerto Rican family on the block in the village, and that she had a teacher hold her so a white girl could hit her. Because she told, like, I heard stories growing up. So, so, you know, the things that they went through, you have to honor that history and how they made it possible for you to even be a student in the school. So we don't think about our elders in the same way. That competitive construct, that's an Anglo-American thing. And so we have to redefine that because our elders deserve respect. And our elders are not 30 or 40, all right? Um, so anyway, but I, I just want to say that because um, it literally, like, everybody in the middle's left out. Like, there's no adults. Like, nobody's, like, stepping up into being a freaking adult. Um, <laughs> it's hard to build intergenerational relationships because decisions are being made while you're in school. And the meetings are being had when you're in school. And so it's really important for organizations to be really mindful about how you integrate young people into leadership in a meaningful way. So at our organization, it's not unlike for young people to be working with somebody who's working on land use, on rezoning, uh, on green gentrification and fighting that, um, or learning science, literally putting science in the hands of young people. So we demystify it, we break it down, because all of these disciplines are made inaccessible to us. We think that these are things we can't do. And the truth is that if we're real educators, if we're good communicators, that we're able to take all of those concepts down, break them out, break them down, and make it accessible. Not dumb them down, just break them down so that they're accessible to people. That's our job as organizers, being available on Saturdays, on evenings, having food and childcare and translation available. And young people facilitate meetings. Um, in Sunset Park, by the way, when we first started doing that, they, we would go into the community board and they would accuse our young people of like stealing paper and pens and things like that. And now it's all about where are the young people. We literally change the culture of how meetings happen in that community. So, um, so you have power, you have power, but it isn't about you, right? It isn't about me. We are facilitators of meaningful engagement for our community. Um, and so. This country is also a country that is about me, is about, it's, it's very about the individual. It's about what's in the interest of the collective and listening to folks. And, and young people can be really ambitious and we romanticize them. Like somehow you're all flawless. You're as flawed as we are, right? So, um, so there's a whole, you know, we can go on and on about intergenerational power. That's something I think a lot about, um, but, um, but, if a meeting, if an organizing effort, if a movement, if an organization is not intergenerational, if this movement, this climate justice movement is not intergenerational, we will fail. So, that was a long answer, I'm sorry. But that's because he's from Sunset. <laughs> I live on 44th Street, by the way. You'll see a big black Puerto Rican flag hanging out, and in the summer you're gonna hear freestyle. Thank <laughs> you.
Um, hola, uh, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Daniel Caballero. Uh, soy centroamericano. My parents are from El Salvador. Um, thank you for your words today. Um, you gave a lot of, um, you gave word to a lot of thoughts that I've had, but haven't had um, the eloquence to um, express them. Um, how do we go about dismantling these systems that gave us nationality, that separate us even more? Um, because right now, with the um, Central American caravans, I see that division amongst um, Centro Americanos, Mexicanos, um, within Latinos um, in our communities. How can we come together and have solidarity? Because I feel that weakens us, and that weakens um, the movements that we try to move forward, um, not having solidarity amongst ourselves as Latinos. And that's affected here in the United States. There's a lot of Latinos who are Republican and uh, go against. Um, <laughs> um, and that speaks to another level of colonialism and how deeply rooted uh, Catholicism and um, these religious institutions are in Latino America. Latino America and how that has translated into the diaspora. So how do we go about dismantling this within ourselves and amongst our peers and amongst uh, me um, with my Mexican brothers and sisters and um, even with, um, there's like this colorism that we have too that shows when we interact with um, the black community here in the United States and, um, and not so much for me in El Salvador but like within, um, Puerto Rico, Cuba, um, and wherever um, Afro-Latinos are, are most prevalent. So how do we go about that? That is a really big, big question. Um, so let's just take, let's just unpack and move the Latinos that are Republicans and just push them aside and not deal with them. Let, let's just, let's not deal with them for a second. Like we don't, we don't engage climate deniers because it's a waste of our time. Uh, so let's just, let, let's focus on folks that should be aligned, right? Um, one of the things that we worry about when we're organizing around climate justice is the people who pull the ladder behind them, right? And that happens in our communities. You've got Mexicans talking about being able to come into the country and closing the borders to Central Americans who are coming in. You've got Dominicans complaining about not being able to come to Puerto Rico, but pushing Haitians out of, out of, out of, out of uh, the Dominican Republic, right? And so I think that we have to have some really hard conversations about the inconsistencies and how those exist in our communities. And the process of decolonizing is hella hard. It is really hard. It's from, from the time we were born until now, that is decolonizing our food, decolonizing decision making, decolonizing our relationships. That is the work and that is really, really hard. Uh, I think you have to be open to knowing that some of, your, some of the ways that you show up in, in a space are a product of things that you might not even be aware of. And that when people call you on it, to really accept it and work on that. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things that I like saying is that when I work with our, like I come into meetings sometimes being real confident, thinking that I have the answer, and then somebody will come up with something that's absolutely brilliant, I'm like, okay, that, you gotta do that. And, it, and, it's, and it's just, because if we really care about what's in the best interest of our communities, we need to approach this work with tremendous amount of humility. You have the privilege of having an education, right? Um, not everybody in our community does. In my family, I was the first, right? But my grandmother who didn't know how to read and write was brilliant and you know that there's a difference between intelligence and an education. That you've got people with a lot of degrees who are in the sharpest crayons of the box, and then you have people who have never gone to school who are absolutely brilliant. And so you need to, so, but you have the privilege of an education. And so you have to be really self-aware because it kind of starts internally. And you need to be able, and you grow by opening up your mind to being around people who have so much to offer to how the solutions come about together. But it, it is really hard. I'm constantly learning, constantly changing. Um, and I may feel really strongly about a point today, and then I'll listen to 10 people who have been thinking about it and exploring it and come up with some ideas that I had never thought about, and I will be like, okay, eso. So, pero es difícil y duele. Duele porque son la misma gente, ¿verdad? Duele. Pero no puedo, no tengo la contesta. 
¿sabes? Porque es difícil. Uh, my name is Carlos Ramos uh, uh, from Geography and Latin American Studies, um, and, and it's really interesting what, what you both uh, were saying about the lack of making this a broader problem than just Puerto Rico, right? Climate change, right? And your take almost, like I read it, it was like climate change could be a way to unite the Caribbean in a way that Right, and, and it's and it's a it's a kind of foul way of doing it because it's right. Climate change is like to see it as a negative thing, right? But it uh, it could right. That that's uh, I think that's really important in, in being able to take advantage of these moments in which there's the door has been open and opportunity is open, and then and then you change, right? I think Roger was kind of uh, alluding to that in his questions early on, and and the panelists also addressed that. Um, for me, it's really uh, talking about 2017, the hurricanes, right? Um, we had Hurricane Irma totally destroy the Virgin Islands. <laughs> and they're right next door. They share common history. They share, they share a very similar political relationship with the United States. And, and then at, at least at a, at a national level, nobody makes that connection, right? And I mean, we're, we're standing in the same latitude <laughs> in regards to, to the United States, right, in regards to climate change, right, so, so, so it's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't see us taking advantage, right, I, uh, kind of becoming more powerful with larger numbers, right, um, and, and that's, that's, uh, that, that's uh, I just wanted to, to make that point and, and also um, talk about climate change, climate change is not only, right, we're talking about hurricanes now, but climate change is also about disease, it's also about uh, uh, losing shorelines, it's about n losing natural resources. It's also about drought, right? We, Puerto Rico was undergoing one of the most serious droughts in its history and the entire Caribbean three years ago, right? And we forgot about that. <laughs> we totally forgot about that. So, so right, I, I think that, 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 uh, that opening of that door, we need to take advantage, right? Uh, we need to learn about it as quickly as possible. And uh, that's one thing, I mean, I do science, right? And I see that that is really hard. I, I, I see the struggles that, that, uh, that Barbara described, right? Professors at the University of Puerto Rico being loaded with four classes. How the hell are you gonna do your research? <laughs> Uh, so, so, so I, I see those as, as limiting factors, right, in, in, in our ability to, to kind, of, kind of react to, to, and, and be able to come up with a new plan, right? Um, and and so, so that was a comment if you want to add to that. But I have a question also with regards to how you consume science. How do, how do you... Uh, how do you tap into the knowledge that's coming out? Because that's really a big challenge, even if you're a scientist, right? Just being able to not only comprehend, but have a, have a, a panoramic view um, that's fair, right? To, to, and, 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 right? And, and science that you can actually use for your purposes, right? And, and with the reason why I'm asking you is, right, I'm a scientist, how do I communicate <laughs> with you uh, if I don't know you, right? What's the best way to, to pass on that knowledge that I develop uh, to you and make it, make it useful? So I, I, I just want to respond to a few things. One is that what we're seeing is that um, universities throughout the United States are getting funding to go in and do research and collect data um, and to uh, make recommendations about what resilience should look like and, and disaster preparedness in Puerto Rico. And those funds should be going to the University of Puerto Rico and to professors in Puerto Rico to collect the data and to do all of that work. And so um, when I've been in those spaces where there, um, I was at a meeting, national meeting, um, with a big foundation, which I won't name, but I will say is the largest foundation on environment and health in the world. And I sit on an advisory board. And, um, and one of them said, um, well, you know, we're doing all of this stuff in Puerto Rico. And I said, why? Well, because we got funded to do it, I said, oh, so we really should have just given the money to the people in Puerto Rico. So you now get to speak for Puerto Rico. And it became a very uncomfortable, awkward meeting. And I feel like, you know, 
Kick me out of the meeting. Kick the only Puerto Rican on the advisory board off the meeting. Watch my tweet tomorrow morning. So, so, so the funding has to go to you all. And, and science, remember that science is not something foreign to us. We have always been in the middle of science, of how we, you know, whether you think about the Amazon, whether you think about how we took care of each other's health without going to the doctors, the things that we mixed, the teas that we had, you know, all of that was part of our culture, science, right? How my grandmother used to take care of me when I was a little kid, besides Alcolado 70, which like, I think like she bathed me in that, that stuff. Oh my God, that and Vicks. Um, but there were natural things too. So, but seriously, it, it, um, it really is time now for scientists to get out of the ivory towers and start putting science in the hands of people and sharing what you know, whether it's how you collect data. For example, there's no baseline data so that you can compare what happens after an extreme weather event and you could say, okay, this is the level of contamination. These are the chemicals that we have in this space that weren't there before because baseline data isn't connected. We found that to happen in Brooklyn when Sandy came through Red Hook and through Sunset Park. So there are a lot of things that people in the community get excited about doing. How do you become, like for example, we've got a project where we work small businesses and we basically teach them how to containerize their chemicals, uh, how, what, what is dangerous and what isn't, how to label it. We want these small businesses to thrive um, and not to disappear because of extreme weather events and we don't want them to be exposed um, to what becomes either fugitive dust or goes flying off you know, a shelf in the middle of an extreme weather event. And so these guys, these blue collar workers that never went to school, that are part, that own these auto salvaging shops, are meeting with scientists and they're meeting with us and we're saying, listen, you put this over here because this, is the, this does, and, and they eat that up. Sometimes they didn't even know that exposure to something could hurt them. You know, so, um, so people are hungry for that. And so that kind of uh, community science um, is, is absolutely necessary in a place like Puerto Rico. And funding should be available to make that happen. Um, so there is a major, major place for that. Um, and you have to be careful now in this government to start talking about it, and calling it climate. You can call it something else. You know, you could talk about environmental health disparities. Uh, you could talk about what happens when, they're tox when there's toxic exposure. You could name it something and take the word climate out, which is what a lot of scientists in the federal government are doing now. Uh, but you also have to challenge universities that are going into Puerto Rico and literally uh, engaging in disaster capitalism. Um, they are literally um, b taking the brain trust out of Puerto Rico. If they don't get the funding, they're gonna leave and Puerto Rico is not going to have that, the, the folks that are experts um, for all of those assessments. So you're really important. Um, and, um, and communicating, I think that you've been trained to work in silos um, and not to tr talk uh, 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 across disciplines. Um, and in climate change, we talk across disciplines. So we know we can navigate our way between talking about brownfields to talking about, um, you know, vehicular traffic and what that means in terms of, like, we, we do that, we are generalists. Um, you have to be comfortable in basically talking across disciplines and coming up with solutions that are interdisciplinary. That's important too. So, so yeah, really important um, that you not lose faith and that you fight back, that you become a science activist. You know, you have to have activist, sci I don't know what the title is, but like some activist scientist or something. So, you know, I'll put a cape on you when you like science, huh? Engage. Yeah, no, but, but, meaningfully, but meaningfully engage and also not allow folks who think that they have all the answers, you know, because maybe they have more degrees or whatever uh, minoritize you or, 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 uh, or do that because they also do that to our folks that have PhDs uh, where they literally talk to us like, like they have all the answers you know, we need to be able to fight back and say to them, well, thank you for that. I'll let you know if I need your support and your assistance. And we need to have that voice to be able to say that and challenge them, you know.
I really want to just take the time to say thank you very much because what you're doing is shifting consciousness and you're standing up against a situation that is, has no intention of changing at all. And so uh, every single word you use, every single thing you say, every single thing you do is essential, imperative, and miraculous. So thank you very much.